So with that, um, I'm sure you've all been already interested in regards to the abstract. So I won't go through and, and read the, the abstract that you see in front of you there. You will come to the presentation because you're interested in what Hugh is going to speak upon. Um, but I will give a bit of introduction. So Hugh started his career in, with Gisborne City Council uh, many years ago, and then had a brief period with Works Consultancy before starting lecturing at the University of Auckland over 30 years ago. Uh, he taught introductory design to the faculty for about 20 years and has coordinated a number of different professional and community issue courses uh, for all final year students for about a decade. His structural teaching in the civil part three was mainly related to timber design and he introduced um, a few, a number of years ago now, a civil capstone project, which is a multidisciplinary project across all areas of civil environmental engineering in part four before he retired to take up an honorary academic position at the end of last year. So Hugh is now enjoying, not having to worry about the first week of semester this week that we've just started um, and capstone project actually, Hugh, you will be uh, we're pretty busy at the moment getting that all organized. So Hugh's had an interest in earth buildings um, for many, many years, um, ever since I've sort of known, I think Hugh, uh, for over 20 years, um, and start, but started with a Tanzanian uh, student who wanted to investigate the properties of adobe um, buildings, and this led into involvement with a group of architects and builders working on the development of the suite of three comprehensive New Zealand earth building standards published in 1998. These standards have uh, been pretty well respected, but in, in, in uh, recent times that's been updated. Uh, and with a volunteer, marathon volunteer effort in 2020. So I'm sure Hugh will talk about those standards in his um, presentation. Some of Hugh's uh, research efforts have been related to the structural uh, timber, but most has been related to earth materials and the seismic performance of housing for the earth standards. So welcome everybody, uh, welcome Hugh. Thank you very much for giving up your valuable retirement uh, time uh, to come and speak to us. Uh, we really do appreciate your, the, the time you're giving to it and we look forward to seeing your presentations. I will stop sharing and I'll ask you, um, you to, to share now your screen um, and we can continue. So please hold, um, I, uh, I think you, you probably prefer to have some of the questions come towards the end, otherwise, um, we may get off track a little bit. So we'll, do, we'll finish the presentation first and then we'll take questions and answer time afterwards. Well, well thank you, Doug. And uh, thank you, ESR. It, it's a, an organization that I'm very pleased exists and I have had just periodic interest. I haven't really been involved, but I, I really support what it is that you guys are doing. And so uh, good evening to you all. Um, I'm going to be talking about these earth building developments, just a little bit about wider aspects, but predominantly the earth building side. Um, I'll be talking about the techno various technologies that are used in earth buildings and some examples of modern earth buildings. And I'm going to put that together with a seismic performance survey that we did of New Zealand and uh, earth buildings and straw bale buildings after the various earthquakes. So I'm going to combine those two bits together uh, rather than separate them out. I'll talk a little bit about the New Zealand standards and a little bit about some research and even less about uh, carbon and energy performance. But with earth buildings, um, you have very low embodied energy, particularly if you're using cob or uh, adobe. And of course, with the natural materials, once the building's finished, it just goes back to the ground. They are low carbon and low energy and um, in, in embodied energy. We are hitting a few things that we need to consider when we talk about um, the lifetime energy and uh, the energy efficiency. And so that's making some changes in the emphasis of what we're doing. I have put uh, thanks there just at the front while people are still looking at their screens. I'll put it up again at the end, but I just wanted to acknowledge a lot of people that have helped over the years 
and Richard Walker in particular, and for some of his materials that I'll be using tonight. So after the 2010 earthquakes, we did a survey. That earthquake was centered in Darfield, magnitude 7.1. And then the February 2011, which was much more uh, localized, huge amount of damage in the center of Christchurch, um, but probably not, not more significant in terms of earth buildings. But we did survey after that and published those survey findings in the bulletin of the New Zealand Society of Earthquake Engineering. I'm going to be using photos from some of these houses just to illustrate the technologies. And then, of course, in 2016, the Kaikoura earthquake at magnitude 7.8 has 900 times the energy of the Christchurch earthquake, um, while the accelerations on the ground are not that much greater. They certainly are significantly greater. Um, they, it was a widespread region and uh, a very significant event. So following that earthquake, we did a, um, a, a trip around. So we started in Christchurch, went up to Hiranui, back around, and then as far as we could go before the road stopped, then up through the um, uh, St. Arnold and back down again. And so in this area, of course, some very significant damage. And uh, Graham North, Tay Stripstein, Richard uh, Walker and I uh, took did that survey. We looked at the houses that we saw and allocated them a level of damage from A of none, B of slight, C of moderate, and um, just made a, a descriptive as well as um, qualitative evaluation of the damage. And we also uh, looked at the modified Macaulay scale, which uh, is based on local accelerations and we're MM6, 7 and 8. And if you look at MM8, uh, MM7, general alarm, people can't stand up, furniture and appliances move, substantial damage to fragile and unsecured objects. And so by asking people, we actually got this uh, qualitative approach to their evaluation of the local earthquake experience. So now going on to the various materials, uh, Adobe is the material sun-dried brick or air-dried brick made from a puddle mixture of earth and clay and uh, sometimes with some um, straw. In New Zealand, we don't tend to stabilize it. And the typical Adobe brick, uh, which is used around the world, around 1,600 to 1,900 kilograms per cubic meter. More recently, we've been looking at low density adobe, which is a mix of clay, sand, silt, and wood fiber. And that wood fiber is wood shavings or wood pulp. And so that gives uh, more tensile strength, a lighter weight, a lower density, and so much better insulation performance. And so you also end up with lower seismic loads. So that's been an area where there's been development that's been moving into our standards. Uh, a heavy adobe house was built around 1997 using some of the principles of the standards, but before our original standards were completed. And when we did our 2010 survey, this house had a crack through the floor and some minor cracking, but little damage to the major house. This house was between the fault line that you saw fault rupture and the Darfield epicenter. So maximum accelerations applied to this building and it was fine. Um, so looking at Adobe, you mix the earth and, and some water, get the moisture content right, put it into the molds. When, once that's dried enough, the mold can come off. And then when it's further dried, it can be stood up to, to dry and, and make those uh, bricks. And then in this lower left-hand corner, I've got some 
geogrid reinforcing that's put in between the layers and then vertical steel reinforcing that gives that integral uh, performance of the earth wall. And that's important for us in uh, seismic resistance. At the bottom right, you can see the inside of Richard's house and some of the beautiful detailing that people get when they build using this. Uh, and again, during our survey, this was a house that was built in 2005, uh, lower story adobe. And there was just a couple of little cracks after the uh, Kaikoura earthquake and possibly, we're not sure whether they were shrinkage cracks or damage, but very minor damage. Another house, uh, a, a more modern architecture. If you look on the right hand side, you can see the conservatory and you can see the exposed adobe inside the conservatory, but a modern house some distance away from the epicenter, so not quite such significant loads, probably MM6 and very little damage but that gives you a, a, a bit of an impression of a modern earth building and very little damage evident uh, in that building. This is a low density house in uh, Golden Bay, which has fantastic views. It's elevated across the bay um, and that's built out of low density adobe. Um, and so that has the advantage of this reduced uh, thermal transmission that you get with the lower density. Um, another well-known technology and uh, is this rammed earth. And in New Zealand, it's mostly pneumatically compacted. And for this soil, you want a sandy or gravelly soil with a good distribution of um, grain size and usually stabilized with five to 10% cement. Um, and that gets a very, it, it requires some expertise to do a good job of it, to get the layers right, to get the moisture content just right. But then you end up with a very highly finished um, product in, in terms of the walls. The, um, this is a house that was in the Wairau Valley um, that we looked at after the survey that was quite an old earth house and that survived well um, following the earthquakes. Cobb is uh, made by using a very similar sort of mixture to what you use for adobe but it's directly placed into the wall. And so here they're mixing it up and then it's wet placed into the wall. And uh, this little building is a, a cafe near Takaka. And you can see the green roof on top of that cafe um, that it makes the most of the environmental uh, aspects of that construction. It's been around for a long time. This is uh, Broad Green House in uh, Nelson. And uh, in our survey, we found a really beautiful high stud uh, 1920s house that uh, had minor damage from the earthquake. But when you look inside, it's got these very high studs, excellent detailing, pressed ceilings, and the damage was really quite moderate, uh, but it was enough to cause quite a scare to the owner. And we're not sure of the status of that house. Uh, pressed earth bricks are where you mix uh, usually some cement with the earth materials and then put it into a machine and uh, either compact it using a hand ram such as a Sinvaram hand press or with a, a um, mechanized hydraulic machine. The problem with the mechanized machines is that they can actually stabilize or apparently make bricks 
that are high quality and then they can fritter away. And so when we invested, when we looked at this house in 2017, there was a small amount of damage that was potentially earthquake damage, but there was quite a lot of damage, which was due to poor manufacture of the bricks themselves. And so the, if they had have followed the standards and followed the procedure of checking their bricks, that would not have happened. Um, and I've put this as a Kaikoura survey, but it wasn't. It was the 2010 or 2011 survey where we looked at a post and beam house where it used pressed earth bricks that were just tied to one another, but were not reinforced. And so that was severely damaged. And it did remind us of the importance of high quality detailing when you come to pressed earth brick. And so we did add extra requirements to pressed earth brick after the earthquakes. Another technology that is similar is where they ram large blocks. And this is a uh, winery uh, near Nelson, uh, near Blenheim, and uh, a, a beautifully finished building. Um, and that one had only moderate, moderate shaking and minor damage. There was a, another uh, pressed block, uh, rammed block house near uh, Kaikoura, very close to Kaikoura, quite high shaking, MM7. And you can see the walls with movement in the wall. And that's a close up of that damage post earthquake. Um, there was no reinforcement, I believe, in this part of the building, but it was able to, there were, there was uh, steel frames in the building. And so this building was able to be repaired uh, by raking out the joints and, and uh, repairing it. A um, more serious story is a, another rammed block house that was uh, in a quite close to the epicenter of the uh, Kaikoura earthquake, probably greater than a 1G horizontal accelerations, also subjected to vertical accelerations, but it's, uh, it, it sustained very serious damage and really was due for demolition. Um, one of the things that you can see is that there's a lot of dry joints and they had made a hollow core sort of block. It's an unusual construction. And you can see that the reinforcing is just not attached at all to the core material. So this was a, um, poor design and poor implementation, uh, but still serves as a warning that you do need to get use of earth materials right. That's the inside of the house. Um, and that was certainly the worst of the more modern buildings that we saw. A more recent technology that we have put into the standards is an internal adobe veneer. This has major benefits because it uses a very simple house construction, a very familiar house construction, but then puts the adobe veneer on the inside of the insulation. And what that does, it means that you've got a heavy earth brick that is within the insulated envelope. So your thermal mass is within the insulated envelope. Um, and what we specify is very careful fixings, both to the wall and directly into the brick so that there is a, a positive fastener that goes into the brick. And so you get um, good performance of that being within the house. So this is one that was built in 2013. 
that we also looked at, and that was the inside of that brick veneer following the earthquakes in 2017. Um, Richard, in particular, put a, a lot of effort into noting every house that we visited, keeping track of all the sorts of damage that was observed, and rating it uh, after that observation. And so that information was used in updating the earth building standards. Our original standards were um, published in 1998. They are cited by the ASTM in the USA and a number of uh, countries around the world refer to the earth building standards from New Zealand. Um, we spent 10 years updating these. We um, and the, the three different standards, their engineering design, materials and construction, and then earth buildings not requiring specific design which is um, similar to the 3604 sort of approach that we're using. And following the um, evaluation, we there were no structural failures in buildings that were built in compliance with the standards. We needed to do a general update. We added some additional limitations that relate to building height and pressed earth bricks. We've included these new technologies of the low density earth in Adobe. Uh, and as was discussed earlier, we need to be uh, improving the insulation because of the new requirements coming in through the MB. And we also added in straw bale as an informative appendix. And straw bale, of course, has very good in terms of its insulation. Unfortunately, once we started our formal part of the standards update for the 2020 standards, MB withdrew the funding because they wanted to put more funding into um, post-earthquake uh, recovery efforts and withdrew our funding that left the earth building association to obtain funding and then work with standards new zealand and publish the 2020 standards unfortunately mb then did not accept them for citation and so the 2020 standards are now going through a new revision and um, we've worked out what detail they want revised and a new committee is being formed uh, right at this time. We hope that the amount of work we can get done in the next month or two, and then we can go through the committee process for the uh, up, probably 2022 update. And so that's the sort of status of the standards. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the research that's gone in behind these standards and some of it in terms of material strength and stiffness, compression, flexural tension, bond strength. And then as part of that, I've wanted to have simplified procedures because you, when you're looking at a lot of houses that are going to be using unique materials for that particular house, and particularly if they're using materials from on site or near to the site, you don't want to be doing thousands and thousands of dollars of laboratory testing before you validate your materials. So we've come up with a flexural test that just uses a post in the ground and a lever arm and uh, a bond test where you're just using a sash cramp and some weights so that we can come up with an initial evaluation before you need to do more in-depth testing or compression tests. The other thing that I've been interested in is uh, looking at the performance, the seismic performance of the houses themselves. And so I've drawn on there an arrow of the assumed direction of an earthquake. They don't behave in that way, but we 
turn them into directional to solve the problem in a more simplified way. And so I'm interested in the out of plane performance of these end walls and then the in plane performance of the side walls relative to the direction of the earthquake. The way that we have done that is to uh, do simplified in plane tests by getting small segments of wall and building those up in the lab and then approximating the sort of load that you get in very typical um, testing for masonry, but our masonry don't like tipping up on edge, so we have to test it on the flat. And we can also take into account some of the loading that goes on top of it. So here you can see a test specimen that's not reinforced, and then a test on a specimen that is reinforced, and we get better performance from those reinforced specimens. Uh, the failure modes, not much different, but you can see that the cracking is more distributed where you have that reinforcement. Um, sorry, that's happening again. And we'll go on. Then the other thing that we were particularly interested in with our lightweight Adobe was that out of plane testing. The best way to do that is to put it on a shake table. But when it takes uh, 30 days or 60 days to dry, then it is actually better if we can do the testing on site where the walls are built. And so we came up with this procedure of getting a uh, wall tilted backwards and forwards to give the equivalent of earthquake loading. And so uh, after we had done that and got a successful performance, we then went and put load, we tilted the wall down and put load on top of the wall. And so you can see adding all the load onto the out of plane wall after it's been shaken backwards and forwards by the excavator. And you can see uh, we did end up with uh, a little bit of a break in some of our framing on the side but the wall is holding together after all of that load. And this one here is showing after we tilted it, we then shook it. So I put accelerometers on the wall and we measured accelerations uh, to get an approximation of out, uh, uh, out of plane earthquake accelerations on that wall as well. The other thing that was particularly concerning to us was when you're looking at this internal adobe, when you've got a veneer after the earthquakes in Christchurch, we saw a lot of external veneers fell off and we were very concerned not to have internal veneers fall off. And so we built the worst case is if you've got a large height of veneer above a doorway. And so above a lintel, you've got, so we've got a short doorway, but a high lintel. And we did the same sort of testing of the um, internal veneer using that same sort of procedure. After that, we then did in-plane testing where we tested along the length of the wall. And these are, those same walls that we tested on their hinge bases that we anchored and then loaded along the length of the wall. And so there are my fourth year students down in the rain trying to set up the instrumentation uh, and doing that on, on, the, on the manufacturer solid earth in their yard. And so that's the sort of test set up and the hydraulics and the jacks up in here and doing lots of measurements on the performance of that wall. So they performed well. Um, we got cracks along the joints, no dislodged bricks, and uh, can cope with a lot of deflection. And we're quite confident of life safety in terms of this light earth material. 
uh, in plane, also ductile. We do have quite a lot of movement and we need to be keeping the serviceability requirements uh, for distance under control. So um, I will, if, if we've got time, we'll do just a little bit about straw bale. And so after the, at the same time as we were looking at the earth buildings, we also looked at the straw bale buildings. And this is a straw bale winery building. This was only subjected to MM5, so it wasn't high accelerations, but it is a two-story building, very high earth uh, straw bale walls. And the only thing that we could find was this tiny crack adjacent to one window when we looked across that building. Um, as we moved into the more severe damaged areas, this was what we saw as we were driving to the house locations that we were looking at. Really severe shaking. And uh, one building we looked at was this straw bale house. And you can see on the right hand side the, the um, truth window or inspection window that shows the straw bale inside the wall. And it suffered some movement and some damage, but nothing of significance for life safety. There was another beautiful new straw bale house down the road, also suffered significant shaking. Uh, the, one of the people that was occupying this happened to be awake at the time, out working, and was uh, fell to the ground, had to crawl because of the severity of the shaking at the time. And in that house, we could not find any damage whatsoever. Absolutely no damage. This one here was at Clarence River probably the most severe shaking of anywhere that we went. And this house, the people said that the books fell out of the bookcase and they were flying up and down off the floor while they were house hanging on for grim death. And we could only find a, tiny, a couple of tiny little uh, cracks, nothing significant. And that was the um, viewport of their, the truth window for their building. So that's um, just my review of the performance of earth buildings, the performance of straw bale buildings. And they have worked in some historic buildings. If they're properly reinforced, properly organized, they are highly uh, effective in seismic regions, just need to be have the right attention to detail to make them work. And so if we're going to get the benefits of the low energy, low carbon, we need to be looking at these technologies it being more widespread and having a focus on dealing on, on reducing the environmental impact and making it easier for these sorts of buildings to be able to be built so that they can get it through the regulatory process. So sorry I've gone on a little bit long. Um, just want to thank EBANS, uh, all the house owners that let us look at their houses, the Standards Committee for thousands upon thousands of hours, and those that contributed to the experimental work. So I'll uh, stop sharing and we can discuss that a bit further. Thank you very much, Hugh. Um, I'm going to give you a, a virtual clap there for um, given that we're not in the room together. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I will now invite um, questions uh, from the floor um, for those that are available that would like to ask uh, Hugh questions. Uh, while you're just thinking of the um, questions that you would like to ask, um, and, and maybe uh, the best thing is if you 
you can use the reactions to raise your hand if there's going to be a number of different people and then I can sort of chair that. Otherwise, please just open the floor to, to take any questions on that. But while, uh, while we're just doing that, I'd just like to say that um, uh, be engineers for social responsibility is, is here to serve uh, as an independent body. Um, I'm on the committee with uh, various number others that are on the, the committee here. Please um, make yourself known to us if you don't know about it. Um, and if you'd like to join us as a group, um, we certainly would look, would, uh, in, uh, would value um, more membership, uh, but also a wider representation uh, across the different professions. So with that, uh, I'll open up to questions. Please ask uh, Hugh any questions in regards to um, his presentation. Roger is putting their hand up here. I'll pass it over to you first, Roger. Hi, Hugh. Thanks for that, that, that excellent presentation and all the insights there. Um, just wanted to ask um, those on-site test panels um, where you subjected the, the panels to, to in the plane and also out of plane forces, there was the appearance of secondary reinforcement in those. Um, were, was, was there also the, uh, that geo mesh that you showed in your photo or was there actual um, chopped fiber in, in that earth that your students were using in those, those um, test samples, test panels? So they were light, uh, low density bricks so that there's quite a lot of fiber in the brick itself. Um, but the wall panel had vertical steel reinforcing which was lightly post tensioned and uh geo grid every third course i think and that that um cut fiber was that um cut polypropylene or was it was it a natural fiber so within the brick um it has a um wood shavings and a, uh, no, the, the geogrid is a polypropylene fiber. Yeah. Has, has anything more been done with chopped flax in, in that sampling work? Uh, there, there is other work that's been going on looking at flax uh, reinforcement. Um, not in what I've been doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a, I see a question also from Andrew. Um, Andrew, please come online and also, but uh, there's a, a question I think that just came to me from questions, but is there a timber framing or supports present in the straw bale houses? Yeah. Yes, in the straw bales, yes. Uh, but not in the uh, earth houses um, or most earth houses. Yeah. Could I ask a question, um, Hugh? <clears throat> um, I, I was just um, wondering about the comparison. I mean, you were looking at, at you know earth and straw bale houses. I was wondering about the comparison with um, houses that were built in in a more traditional way, um, both in terms of the the earthquake performance and in terms of the cost. So are you able to make any comment on that in terms of, you know, uh, how did the, the straw bale houses uh, and the earth houses uh, compare uh, to normal, quote, normal houses and all in, in terms of performance and in terms of cost? I'll make a quick stab at that, but I do see that there's some other people here that would be able to answer that question better. Um, generally, it's at the higher end of the price range for a normal house. Um, and the uh, performance, I would say, is um, in the in the straw bale houses again they need to be well constructed but the properly constructed performed as well as any uh typical uh, timber house um, the earth houses are heavier and probably would end up with a little more low level damage i would think 
but they could be repaired to you quite easily? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I see, uh, there is a question which probably I think uh, carries on quite nicely from Andy Buchanan. Uh, hi, Hugh. Where does the ductility come from? Uh, the earth material looks heavy and brittle. So how come the seismic performance is so good? With low ductility, we would expect very high accelerations, hence lots of non-structural damage. Did you see that from Andy? So when you're talking about uh, Adobe, you actually end up with some movement in the um, planes of the um, material. And in the light material, there's ductility within the material itself. When you go to rammed earth, it's really very rigid. Um, and while we do get a little bit of ductility, it's actually generally got way more strength than it needs and is quite near to elastic, I would think. Yeah, so Hugh, um, it's Andy here. Nice to, good day. I, I asked that question. It seems to me that, that if it, I remember after the, Christchurch earthquakes, you spent a lot of time in Christchurch testing houses, timber framed houses, where there yep. was lots of movement and there was ductility and nailed connections. Yep. And I just don't see this at all in these earth houses. And so in the in the rigid ones, what that then means is that if there's not a lot of ductility, you're going to have very high accelerations. And I would have thought that would lead to a lot of non-structural damage because that's what we saw in multi-story buildings in Christchurch. Did you, did you observe non-structural damage? I mean, to, to ceilings and bookcases and furniture and things like that? Um, not that I recall, Andy. Um, we only saw one or two uh, rammed earth buildings, which are the ones where you do have that much stiffer material. And uh, we are generally single story and occasionally two story. So that the the upper level accelerations are not as significant as what they would be in a multi story. Um, in terms of the um, Adobe you actually end up with a little bit of movement in the material. And so even though the bricks themselves are rigid, the overall system does have a little bit of movement. And so uh, there is some uh, ductility there. The other thing is that we're using a light post tensioning so that if you do get some rocking at all, you get um, movement in your, in your uh, steel rods. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's all very interesting. I, I suppose that it's actually not ductility we're looking for. It's damping. Yeah. Um, have you did you able to estimate how much damping you had in some of these buildings? No, I haven't. Um, it's a very good question, though. Okay. Look, I'm, I I don't mind ask any more. I just want to say. I'm really impressed. It's a very nice presentation, you, and I'm extremely impressed as to how well most of those buildings perform. It's absolutely. incredible. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's what surprised me so much as well as how well they seem to perform. Uh, Lizzie also has a question saying, "How can we acquire the report on straw barrel houses post earthquakes in Kaikoura?" And that they're putting uh, in a building consent soon for a straw barrel house in Christchurch. So I'd like to know more information about how to get a copy of the report, you. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a formal report of the uh, 2016 uh, survey, uh, but the 2010 Earth Building Standards do have a, an appendix for straw bale, and so you'll probably find that really helpful for uh, your building consent. Oh, thank you. Can I just um, go a bit further with that? So we had a geotech report and they, um, because we're on a mass movement zone on Huntsbury Hill, they made an assumption that um, that plastering of over straw bale would not 
be a good idea. Um, meanwhile, um, our structural engineer thinks that it's totally possible because he's done um, engineering for straw warehouses before. Um, but it just makes it a little bit difficult for getting consent. And I just thought maybe um, even a draft report or something that you have would help, or just even to help educate the, the geotech engineer. Um, there would be others that would be better able to advise in terms of uh, experience with straw bale, um, but certainly you're going to need plaster on your straw bale. And it's not there as a structural component, it's there as part of the um, overall system and, and material protection. Uh, Josh has had his hand up for a while as well. Josh, if you want to unmute your, yourself and ask your question, that'd be great. Hey, kia ora. Um, thank you, Hugh, for your presentation and for all the work that um, you guys have, have done over the years. Um, I'm pretty new to earth building and also, um, yeah, I'm, I live in Gisborne, so it's cool that you've started out here in the Gisborne Council. Um, and I currently rent a home here. And um, my question is, is, is there any work being done on streamlining the possible like process and the affordability in maybe doing like kit homes? Um, is an process to um, people without large incomes? Um, in terms of straw bale, I believe there has been some concept work um, by Min Hall and her students at um, Unitech. Uh, okay. In terms of, uh, I, it, it's not uh, implementation ready, I don't believe. Um, I don't, I can't comment further than that. Yeah. yeah, okay. My, I was thinking along like we, we have a lot of local sawmills. So um, the low density earth bricks that was in your presentation, I was just thinking like if you could have a place that was maybe a certified builder of those that then was distributing them or there's no kind of systems along the lines of something like that, that could maybe follow these a floor plan almost to um, maybe not sell kits but um, provide the information and the regulations and things like that. So the four two nine nine earth building standards are really designed so it, they were originally intended for owner builders to be able to use. With the changes in building regulation, that's more difficult. But you can go a long way towards designing what you would want uh, using the information that's given to you in 4299. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you again for all, all the work that everyone's doing towards this. That's awesome. Thank you for your question, Josh. I'll pass over to Lindsay, who has a question as well. Do you unmute yourself, Lindsay? Thank you for that. Hey, thanks for an outstanding presentation, Hugh. Very much enjoyed it. And I really like your approach to the low tech on site testing things. My question might sound stupid, but I'm interested to know how plentiful the raw materials are or how readily available they are. I'm interested not in one off, but in the potential of scaling low carbon construction. And I, while I don't see this as a, a universal application, it'd be nice to think that the availability of raw materials was no impediment to it being used at some sort of scale. Can you comment on that, please? Yeah, um, it generally works quite well for um, when you have a moderate size section and you can excavate some material and use it on site, um, but you need to have the right sort of soils for that to work. Otherwise, you're going to need to use quarry materials. The 
if you are going large scale and you're using quarry materials, you do end up then with transportation costs. So if I may, the, the, the corollary to my question is, if is it quite common for sites to have suitable materials? I don't know how how broad the spectrum is of suitable material acro across the, the New Zealand countryside. And I can, uh, others will be able to answer that better. If you're flexible about the sort of construction, then you'll be able to uh, if, if, you're, if you've got a clay material, you're not going to be doing rammed earth. And if you've got a sandy material, then you're not going to be doing adobe. Um, so that there will be some constraints depending on the sites. But um, I, there will be others that would be better able to comment on the, on the uh, wider availability. I don't know, Richard, if you have a thought on that. Well, there is a well-established adobe yard in uh, North Nelson that's produced hundreds of thousands of bricks over the last year using the Mutri clay. So that's an excellent source of material. Uh, one of the earlier slides that Hugh showed of the Toto's Cafe, that was material just dug out of the um, excavated bank for the building platform separation point granite clay which is excellent for coal quite a number of houses have been built in golden bay using the separation point granite clay and it seems to perform very well so fortunately in the nelson area we've got the mutri clay which is widely available in the nelson south nelson Motueka area for adobe bricks and the separation point granite clays both in the Motueka area and golden bay areas for cob of course the more um Less clay materials are required for rammed earth, but you know, quite a few rammed earth houses have been built successfully in the Nelson area using the local materials, usually with a mixture of materials. And if you haven't noticed, uh, Peter Oranshaw has uh, put a comment in the chat box there to, there's a company called Straw Sips, doing straw structurally insulated panels and a website there for uh, people if you haven't seen that as well. Um, so Thies, you also have a question as well? You're on mute, I think, if you're trying to talk. No, you, uh, you put your hand up and it's gone down again. Okay. So. Any other questions? Could I just um, comment on that um, availability of materials on in one um, project that I worked on with a family group on the Firth of Thames the, the was for rammed earth and the material available wasn't didn't have a high enough sand content and we, we mixed sand in on on site um, successfully um, it was more work and it was more handling involved in it but it is feasible if those materials don't have to be carried too far yeah I, mean, I think uh, from a comment that i'd make with that i mean obviously in terms of a low carbon footprint of a um any building construction it's local or possible uh, materials is, is fundamentally important so i think you do need to think carefully about where your, your site location will be if you're not in materials that are conducive to these types of buildings, uh, because the, the emissions that will come from transporting that will far outweigh the other um, benefits. So I think the, uh, from a transport perspective, that's a very important aspect to try to build as locally as possible with the materials that are available. Any other questions for, for Hugh? Yeah, I had a question, you. How do you actually guarantee the variability of the material or other way around the consistency of the material from the first to the last brick? How is that done? I saw you do one test, but uh, you might, uh, of course, need thousands of bricks for one building. How do you make sure they are all of a consistent quality? 
Yeah, um, that's a good question. You do need to look at the, 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 where you're going to get your stockpile from and make sure that you can get moderate consistency before you start. Um, but so what you're doing is you're doing some preliminary testing just to uh, validate the material. And then there is an ongoing testing regime that needs to carry through the building construction. And so that there's a requirement for testing that's ongoing. Um, and um, for quality control. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you. The, um, I, I presume, Hugh, as well, um, that there is quite a bit of uh, an initial learning of how to build these if you're trying to do it for the first time. Uh, would it be a, a wise thing to, to build your outhouse or uh, your garage maybe first before you start building the main structural components or something? Because I, I'd imagine there's quite a bit of learning that goes in the first few thousand bricks of things that you're building. Yes, exactly right. Um, and it also means that you can look at the quality of what you're achieving and, and uh, be assured before you embark on a major project. Yeah. There's also another comment uh, that there is a quarry in Whangarei that sells Adobe mixed clay as well. So. Has uh, anybody, Hugh, actually tried to um, put a sort of a carbon uh, calculation on um, the various sort of types compared to perhaps tradition, traditional house building? Um, Peter may be able to answer that question better than I can. No. Okay. Um, probably has been dug. Um, there is some, there's quite some major research going on in uh, the UK at the moment. There's quite a big European funded project on uh, COB. And so they'll be doing much more in depth evaluation, I expect. Any other questions? It looks like we're coming towards the end of the, uh, the questions from that. Um, Ian, do you have a question? Yeah, um, thanks you for the presentation. I just, you wondered, you mentioned um, you like making more extensive use of this technology. I just wondered what the, the main barriers you see are to, to it being more widespread use. Um, I think that there is um, partly just awareness um, and partly the industry is very uh, focused in specific directions and uh, the regulation procedures is something that we've had to battle with. Um, but those are the main things I would think of, but there's others again that would answer that better than me. I don't know if Alan might uh answer that question alan drayton can you answer that on mute you're on mute alan if you uh, I, I think you're right here I, I think it is around about awareness um and <clears throat> you know it's it's it, for me it's just this word of mouth thing i know there are a lot of uh, other technologies out there you know to, to advertise nowadays but um as you know we mostly do rammed earth and um since covid when i decided to make a showroom uh, of various different panel types and things at my house um we at the moment have something like 20 something jobs lined up to take us through to possibly the end of 2025 and have had to give up building to focus entirely on just doing rammed earth and 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 that's just a um an awareness thing where it just just seems to have, you know in, in this particular thing taken off like wildfire and, and i I, I see that happening over the years that I've been particularly fond of rammed earth. You know, one minute it's, it's straw bales, hempcrete, they're all, you know, great systems. And um, yeah, it's just that awareness and, and the way it goes. 
I, I would have uh, would have thought that with the some of the logistics problems we're getting with some other more traditional materials that there, there will be a a growing interest um, um, and a and a potential um, significant increase going forward if, the, if if people can find the information. Yeah, um, I don't think people would change to rammed earth just because they couldn't get jib board. But at the same time, I feel totally blessed that I'm not looking for jib board. <laughs> yes, exactly. So Hugh, I was just wondering whether did you could you elucidate elucidate a little bit more on the, uh, the issues of why uh, MB um, is making it quite difficult for the standards to what what what's going on there? Is there a barrier that's there that's causing problems? I, I think um, four or five years ago there was Doug. Um, now there is more collaboration to um, make things happen and there's some modest funding for that as well okay. um, it was i think it was rather unfair but at the time of the 2016 earthquake mb just pulled the plug on us after we had the committee formed after we had meetings arranged all sorts of stuff and so that was um they felt under pressure because of all the damage in Wellington that was coming out of the earthquake. But we just happened to be on the um, receiving end of that, I think. I, I think there was also no champions inside MB, and we probably need uh, people that have more focus on the broader view. Okay, and Josh has asked another question here. Thanks for that. Uh, have you done any monitoring of hempcrete strength and do you or anyone else see hempcrete being a good earth building material? I know of it, but I don't know anything about it. Um, they'll leave that to others. Anybody else want to pitch in on that question, uh, Roger? You're on mute. Yeah. Oh, this um, I, I might be sidetracking a little. It was just really to ask Alan uh, whether, the, in response to something that Ian was asking, um, whether there is a, an element of a, cus, a client needing to be have a higher level of commitment to go with an. Uh, one of these types of buildings than than the traditional style of, of building that's my personal observation is i think you have to have fairly committed clients who believe in you know have a, a fundamental underlying value for that that type of approach uh possibly i, I certainly wouldn't um suggest trying to convince or talk someone into an earth building. Um, but certainly, you know, show them an earth building, take them to one and, and get them inspired. That's, that's a little bit different. But uh, if they're not the type of folk that um, feel attracted to earth buildings, then that can be problematic. Um, but yeah, uh, like I say, there, there does seem to be a wider range of people now. Um, being attracted to earth buildings as, as far as I can see, um, not only residential, but um, we're doing a reasonable amount of uh, commercial work as well with our, uh, our thin panel rammed earth that is used. All right, I think uh, we're coming towards the end of the question time. So um, I'd just like to again, Thank uh, Hugh very much for, for presenting tonight. Um, we really appreciate you, you giving your time up now that you're retired as well. And, uh, although you're still an honorary, uh, honorary person in the department and we like to lean on you for that sort of aspect of it, but it's been a great pleasure to have you speaking tonight. I would just like to, uh, to remind you that, um, you know, uh, that we do put up these, and uh, that's why we record them. I've uh, shown here the ESR, Engineers for Social Responsibility webpage. Uh, please come and visit the site. There's a number of different things there, including past events, 
on the left hand side here and you'll see uh, different things that we, we the committee is involved in. Uh, and if you go to the events part of it, you'll see the previous um, events that are up there and, and links to basically watch those recordings as well. Um, and again, with that, I'd just like to say thank you, Hugh, for presenting to us and uh, preparing that. And um, thank you, everybody else, for attending and for your questions. It's been an enjoyable evening, and I wish you all the best for the rest of your evening. You can enjoy your, your red wine now, sitting down, looking at your earth houses and straw bale and construction and dream of your next building. Thank you very much. Thanks, you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Very well. Thank you. Good night.